My take on Thomas Seymour has always been a bit different than most. In my everyday life, I often look for the best in people. It's not until I cannot find any redeeming qualities in a person that I am able to determine my interest in a friendship. Lately, I've been on my quest to find good qualities in Thomas Seymour. Hi, I'm Rebecca Larson, and you're listening to my Tudor's Dynasty podcast. In today's episode of A Brief History, we take a look at Thomas Seymour, son of John Seymour and Marjorie Wentworth. Seymour was born about 1508, presumably at Wolf Hall. He was one of ten children, six sons and four daughters, born to John and Marjorie. You may recognize him best as brother of Queen Jane and Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset. Or, better yet, the man who wished to marry Princess Elizabeth, but ultimately wed the widow of Henry VIII, Catherine Parr. The Seymour family descended from a long line of wealthy ancestors. For generations, they held a leading place among English gentry. Thomas Seymour's career was fairly short, but definitely memorable. Today, when Thomas's name is brought up in conversation or debate, it is usually followed by name-calling, like ambitious or greedy, and leads to a hot debate about what kind of man he was. Thomas and his brother Edward were relatively unknown until their sister Jane became queen consort. In TV programs like Showtime's The Tudors, the Seymour men were instrumental in arranging Jane's rise to the throne. Author John McLean of Life of Sir Thomas Seymour states that there is no reason to believe that the Seymour family took any part in promoting the marriage between Henry VIII and Jane. I'm not certain I believe this, since it was often reported that fathers and brothers used their daughters and sisters as pawns. You can beat the judge. It wasn't until roughly a year after his sister Jane became queen that Thomas emerged as a gentleman of the Privy Chamber. After Jane gave birth to a prince and sadly died, Thomas's career really began to take off. The death of his sister in October 1537 did not diminish his royal favor, when in 1538 he was knighted and is documented as sharing in the wealth of the plundered property of the church. Upon the death of King Henry VIII and the accession of Edward VI, Seymour was made Baron Seymour of Sudley and Lord High Admiral. As we now know, his brother Edward was raised to Duke of Somerset and Lord Protector, making him, after the king, the most powerful man in England. This essentially led to an ongoing feud between the two brothers, as Thomas believed he should have been given a much greater title since he was also uncle to the king. Thomas Seymour did not marry until 1547, even though he was a very attractive man who was generally well respected by his peers. One can imagine that he shared his bed with many ladies over the years, especially since he had frequently traveled with his often scandalous cousin, Sir Francis Bryan. It wasn't that Thomas wasn't proposed to marry. In his lifetime, he was twice suggested to wed Mary Howard, Duchess of Richmond. Mary was the daughter of the illustrious Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, and widow of Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond. Richmond was the illegitimate yet recognized son of Henry VIII. Not long after the death of Henry VIII, Thomas Seymour looked to marry Princess Elizabeth, whom he approached via letter not long after the death of her father. We can assume that his proposal was mostly to raise his own station after his brother had denied him a great title that he rightfully deserved. When Thomas turned his attention back to his former flame, Catherine Parr, she appeared more than willing to rekindle what they had before Henry turned his attention on her. She even goes so far in a letter written around mid-February 1547 to mention that her mind was fully bent the other time she was at liberty to marry him before any man she knew. However, God had other plans for her and wished her to wed Henry VIII. It was merely months after the death of Henry VIII that we hear of midnight visits between the couple at Chelsea. They married secretly not long after and an exact date is unknown. After Thomas and Catherine had been secretly married, they knew that they needed approval of the Lord Protector, and they had not yet received it. Thomas was a sharp man. He knew that if he could receive the blessing from his nephew, the king, that all would be well. So what did he do? He had a discussion with the king's servant, John Fowler. He put Fowler up to ask the king whom he should marry. When Fowler brought it up in conversation with the king, Edward suggested first 
Anne of Cleves, and then quickly followed by his sister Mary, to assist her with changing her mind on her religion. Clearly, this is not what Seymour wanted to hear. Catherine Parr also took up the cause and wrote letters to her stepson, where she was able to keep his good favor. By June 1547, the king was writing a letter of congratulations to Catherine on her marriage to his uncle, seemingly believing it was his idea that they should wed. The secret marriage, under the rule of Henry VIII, would have either cost them both their heads or a lifetime in the Tower of London, had become recognized by the king. They were officially husband and wife in the eyes of the crown. On the 30th of August, 1548, Catherine Parr gave birth to a daughter, Mary. Both Catherine and Thomas were very happy, and everything appeared to be going well for the queen. However, not long after giving birth, things began to turn for Catherine. She became feverish and incoherent. On the 3rd of September, she is recorded by her close friend as being suspicious of her care, saying she was not well handled. Every time I read the testimony of Elizabeth Tyrrett, I'm highly skeptical because she never approved of Thomas Seymour. Although she also mentions how when Catherine was inconsolable, Seymour climbed into bed with his wife to hold her hand and comfort her. There is no documentation of Thomas Seymour's sexual liaisons prior to his marriage to Catherine, and there are no reports of him having any mistresses. I truly believe that he loved Catherine since before she was married to Henry VIII and continued to think about her until the day they were able to rekindle their relationship after the death of her third husband. While he was indeed a very ambitious and possibly greedy man, he was also human. As the saying goes, he got the short end of the stick when it came to the passing out of titles. Thank you so much for joining me today on A Brief History of Thomas Seymour. If this podcast was of interest to you, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Tudor's Dynasty. 